Market observations, Melbourne, Victoria. Now today we're doing a deep dive on the Frankston local government area. For those that don't know, and I will dive into the map in a moment, it is in the southeast of the city following the shoreline, following the bay area along down there to the south. Now we've chosen Frankston today as it typically is an investment grade area, a nice established area where over the last 10 to 15 years, it has been, I guess, an investor heartland. The nation's investors have been looking to Frankston as an area that has gentrified over that time. You know, we've looked at prices going from three to four hundred up to over a million dollars now in many of the pockets of the suburb. It has undergone tremendous gentrification, tremendous price growth over the time. So I do use it in this example as representative of the overall Melbourne market for us as investors. We're not talking about own occupiers. We're not talking about house and land packages or new housing estates. We're talking about good, strong, established investment grade areas. And for that reason, that's why we're going to use Frankston today for the purposes of our analysis. Now, please feel free. If there's any other areas in Melbourne you would like us to focus on, please jump into the comments below, sing them out. We're happy to take some feedback and look at building in some analysis for those areas in the next few weeks. So jump into the comments. Love to start a discussion. We've chosen Frankston uh, for those reasons as mentioned above, but it is only one area. So let's jump right in. All right, let's get our bearings. We can obviously see Melbourne up here as the greater Melbourne area, obviously extending further north out of view here. But we've got Frankston down here in the southeast. It does follow the bay around. You've got a lot of expensive you know, upper socio areas coming down through the bay. Frankston has traditionally been the unloved child. It's traditionally been a lower socioeconomic area, but I did mention over the last 15 or so years, it has gentrified very strongly, okay? And that tends to happen as a suburb, as an area does get built out, as a, as a city, sorry, does get built out. It does push wealth and price uh, into the periphery. We've had a lot of infill development through this area in the last 10 years. You know, an extreme amount of properties being built. It is a separate access point into the city, Traditionally, Frankston, it, you know, for those that are compu com commuting north, do take highways, do take, uh, you know, the M3, but then also there is a train station, train line as well. So let's zoom in there and we'll get our bearings on the suburb as itself. All right, so the Frankston area is this suburb area here. Remember, we've got a Frankston hospital, public and private hospital. This is the focal point of the area. You're coming down into South Frankston on the south side of that hospital. This is the owner-occupier investment grade heartland. As you're coming inland, you've got supply. You know, this is the house and land package. It's a spruker uh, focus of, of Melbourne, you know, to a large degree and even further north. Um, and you've got coastal areas here, which are, you know, higher price points. The funny thing with Frankston is the coastal, the beachfront access is traditionally higher density. So a lot of unit blocks, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, unlimited supply, you know, knocking down building of unit blocks, etc. So we've traditionally stayed away from this area. Frankston has traditionally been for investors, three or four bedroom family home type investment properties, stuff that you can buy, you can renovate, you can hold longer term. It's, it's a question now of can we achieve the yield that we need as investors, but that's typically what we're playing with in the Frankston area. So now we've got our bearings, let's take a deeper dive into the market dynamic. Before I jump right in, I need to reiterate property investment is a science. It is a market like any other market. It is driven by supply and demand. It is driven by human emotion and buyer behavior. For that reason, we want to be analyzing the demand side drivers. We want to offset that against the supply side drivers and then form a view of the overall opportunity. That helps us to understand the scope of potential in the area. Then we need to take a deeper dive at a more granular level to determine, is this the right time to buy? in this area of opportunity. And so that's probably gonna be the focus of today. We've got to focus on is there opportunity here and is it the right time to buy in this area to capitalize on that opportunity? Now in timing the market, there's a few frameworks for that type of assessment that are there, that are in the dialogue nationally from investors. You know, things like the property clock, I tend to think of it more of a buying window. Are we in or are we out? Is it the right time to, to, to have the, the market working in our favor or is it not? So think of 
the buying window, the property clock as the micro entering into a suburb. And, you know, we don't want to do that unless the area has a good, strong macro, you know, local government area or even above, you know, opportunity driving us forward. So just keep that in mind. Let's dive in now into some of these individual elements. So the market opportunity, the overall, the macro, the top layer, let's have an identify, let's identify things there. We like to start this study with an identify, with, with, a, with a deep dive into the employment landscape. So focus here on healthcare, social services, retail trade, and there is construction. We've seen a lot of the new homes, subdivisions occurring in the area, but we do know that it has those two large base hospitals. It is a focal point. Uh, that is a backbone to this type of an area. It does employ a lot of people in the market, but it's still only 20% of employment. That is still very diverse in our eyes. On a national level, that's in the top quartile in terms of employment diversity. So no problems there. And I do love to see healthcare and social services as our big ticket item, as our main employment. It is a strong backbone. Typically these areas nationally have performed very well when that is the primary source of employment. So very a big tick there. We're looking at the overall unemployment rate. So obviously some oscillations and variants over COVID, you know, lockdowns, no lockdown. Melbourne's been obviously very exposed to this. Uh, the unemployment rate is actually very healthy. On a national level, it is outstanding. It's around that 5% unemployment rate, which, you know, is held up very well through COVID. And that is, you know, almost full employment. That's uh, very good employment, uh, unemployment rate nationally at the moment. So you know, a very buoyant and efficient employment landscape. Population growth. Now this is a, a secondary factor. You, we don't want to use this as a primary signal to find an area. And I'll explain why in a moment. I did touch on in our previous video. Frankston has traditionally been, or it is now at least, a low population growth area. When compared to Melbourne overall, low population growth. Frankston, you know, the suburbs proper are quite well established. There's not much scope for infill development in those Frankston suburbs proper. Um, so therefore, population growth is low in those areas because it's a relatively well established area. That does not mean there is unmet demand. And that's what we're trying to detect and identify today, the degree of unmet demand, because that's what really drives price growth. Population growth might be wonderful and high, and I have seen some conversations online in the last week where you know other industry pundits or commentators are talking about, let's find these areas with population growth. Well, they don't stop to think. Population growth is by very definition, meaning people are moving to the area. So there has to be somewhere for them to move to. They have to have a roof over their heads. So that's by definition, high population growth areas has good demand, but it is met with supply. Remember what causes price growth? It is demand with unmet or that is not met by supply, a demand side imbalance, okay? And that sometimes means that the area has low population growth. Not many people can move to the area because it has very low vacancy rates or very few dwellings available for purchase or that have been built. Okay, so typically in these areas, low population growth does not mean it does not have unmet demand. There might be five, seven, eight percent of people lining up wanting to move to the area who can't. So in this example, like Toowoomba in our recent video, low population growth, it's good to understand how things fit together, but it's not necessarily a bad signal. So let's move on. I'm not put off yet. Purchase analysis. This is where we're starting to get down into the, the buying window, the property clock type analysis. We've defined the opportunity. Let's have a look at the tea leaves. Let's have a look at the on the ground market dynamics and see what's going on. All right, days on market, very low, extremely tight market. We're under 10 to 20 days on market for the last 12 months and we've just popped up above it. So on a national level, this is extremely tight, even tighter than Brisbane. You know, even tighter than the Adelaide market that we've recently reviewed as well. This is an extremely tight market, about as lower days on market as I've ever seen. But it has popped up recently. And as we go on through this analysis, this is going to become uh, the area. The last two or three months is going to become the focus of our attention. All right, we understand we're in a very tight market, but it is trending in a different direction in the last couple of months. And that's where we're gonna be paying our attention. 
All right, this is a seasonal factor, high competition. We can see while days on market have been very low, we've had extremely high competition. It did peak here in September, so did a lot of places across the country. Spring buying season, high competition, lots of people active in the market. We have had seasonal downturns, uh, but this is concerning. The level of competition, the number of immediate sales has dropped through the floor in the last four weeks. Okay, this is February. We cut the time off here in February. So the level of competition here has dropped through the floor in the last few weeks. When you look at this price signal here, where days on market has suddenly started popping up, right? This is, ex this is an extremely fast transition. Almost as each day goes on, another day is added to days on market. That means there is a halt in the buying activity in the market. And it is once again confirmed here by the number of immediate sales. So it's as if people have just stopped buying here for a particular reason, we're not sure. This might start giving you some hints. Asking prices. Okay, we've gone here from $656,000, $75,000 up here to almost $800,000 in a period of nine months. This is extreme and rapid price growth. You know, this has been a very common story nationally in the last 12 months, but you know, very few places you know, more so than Frankston. Extremely high price growth activity. And we can see it plateaued here heading into Christmas and it stopped and it started to retrace. Okay, so this is a market where the market said, great, we're not willing to pay $800,000 for Frankston. This is gonna be our cap and the demand has dissipated. Okay, it's held, but you know, what is a great price uh, handbrake on future price growth? Well, previous price growth. And this is evident here. The market has had a full head of steam, days on market under 10 or under 20, sorry. And then it has now fully run out of steam here and retracing. So this is now confirmation. This is the reason why, you know, we're seeing this competition drop off. It's because there are few people willing to pay this price in the market today. Stock inventory, this is not the reason, this is stable. All right, this is holding. You know, it's oscillating, but really it, it, it is still in an acceptable band or range. It's not like there's more properties coming into the market. It's just that people aren't necessarily willing to pay $800,000 for the privilege of buying. Days of remaining supply. This is not the reason either. We, can, we saw that days on market was, was, was popping and jumping, but the listings haven't built up in the market. So they are reasonably turning over or there's not a, a necessarily a, a groundswell of supply entering the market. So this is not the reason either. Percentage above asking price. You know, so through that hysteria, through that rapid price growth, we did see the level of discounting, well, properties selling for more than the asking price increasing. Okay, looking at houses here, we're over 10% above asking price. You know, that's extreme levels where the sales agents don't have a clue where to price a property and people are coming in with offer over offer scenarios on each dwelling. But this has cooled off. So this is a sign that the market has turned. The demand at $800,000 is lacking, it's patchy. Let's jump into the rental analysis. So this is now telling the story of the number of rental listings on the market. So this is oscillated. It has been decreasing slightly as a trend line over the 12 months, but it has jumped up again here. You know, so with this market, it has reached a peak. It is now cooling off. It is slowing down. Is it set for another run? Is it set to build up once again? Um, the number of rental listings online, this is a bearish signal, okay? It is starting to build back up again. It's heading in the wrong direction. If this was heading down this way, we we're seeing further tightening in the rental market, then we might be positioning ourselves for another run in this market. This signal is bearish, negative. This one is quite bullish, okay? Throughout this period of rapid price growth, we have seen rents also increasing, you know, 425, up to 470, 450 to 470 dollars per week. That's a very bullish signal. It has continued through this period where there have been more properties on the market. When we look at that in isolation though, it can be sometimes a little bit de deceptive. This is a rolling 30 day median, all right? That means that since Christmas, there might just be more four bedroom houses renting. It might be people coming there for, for, for studying, you know, people share houses, it might be families moving to the area. Uh, this might be not necessarily representative of the overall market dynamic. 
All right, so sometimes one signal is not enough for us to dive into a market. There might be a story behind this that means that, you know, or, or provides a reason. So this is a bullish signal, but further investigation, there is uh, incongruency. There is conflict here, especially when you say, hang on, the number of listings has just popped recently, but we haven't seen rent slowing down, right? If this was to continue coming down here or stabilizing, that's probably what I would be expecting. The yield. Obviously, there's been price growth. There's been rental growth. Yields have not really kept up. This is the lower, median, upper quartile of yields in the suburb for the last 12 months. We have seen there been a general trend line from just over 3% now to just under 3%. So rents haven't necessarily kept up with price growth, but they haven't done a bad job. All right, they have, we have seen extreme amounts of price growth. They haven't done a bad job and we, we, you know, they have stabilized. They have bounced off the bottom here as well. So that's not necessarily a bearish or a bullish signal. Days on market for rental properties, this is now popping. So it's as if people have stopped buying and they've stopped renting in the market. They're moving elsewhere. This is probably outside the scope of today to understand why, but this is what the market is telling us. So at a high level, uh, medium sale price. So this is telling us the same the, the same story as the asking price as well. We can see this has really rocketed forward, and probably this is uh, you know a lagging indicator to compared to the for sale price. Remember, this sold price is a function of for sales price and suburb discounting. So this is the output, the sold price, and we can see this. There is a, a lag. Right, you know, this is a few weeks late because it takes a while for sale listings to come through. We know this market's potentially trailing off here into the future. So in summary, I feel we've had extreme price pressure and growth in Franks in the last 12 months, all right? It's traditionally been an area that we've uh, focused on as investors. It's been an investment grade gentrification area with good amenities and the ripple effect really working in its favor. We've got scarcity driving factors like water. We've got established areas with homes we can value add to, but inland we've got a lot of supply. It typically hasn't really impacted Frankston because there are different access points into the city. But really with this level of price growth in the last 12 months, it is not in a buying zone. It is firmly in a slowdown phase. Uh, you know, there are some green shoots there with rents increasing week on week but that signal is not confirmed. It is incongruent to other rental side figures. So for me, definitely missed our mark with Frankston. If there's any other areas, as I mentioned, in Melbourne area that you'd like us to do a deep dive on, please sing out. Maybe stick away from the new housing estate areas, you know, those uh, cheating, you know, areas that you've just been suggested to by your mortgage broker or your accountant. Let's not go there. Let's try and find some good investment grade areas that are relatively established that, you know, potentially might compete at a national level and dive in. I would love it if you could like and subscribe to this channel and video. It would mean a lot to me. It shows me that we're really hitting the mark here with this content. Please make sure to subscribe and select the bell icon so you are the first to be informed of any future videos that we do release. Now, we are a research company first and foremost, but we do also work with individuals about planning out their portfolios, determining what type of investments they could be potentially buying to meet their goals and to work along towards those goals. And then we work with you in an advisory and a buyer's agent capacity with our partners. So this is a really important call to action for you. If you like what you're seeing and you'd like to have a chat further, there is an offer that I'm willing to, to extend to you around a 60 minute consultation with one of our wealth advisors. Let's take a deeper dive. There's no obligation. You'll walk away from that consultation with a clear picture of where you are now and where you want to get to and a wealth plan in your hot little hands. It's gonna map out the next 20 years, the investments that you potentially could make and how to really execute on them. So it'll be wonderful if you'll take us up on that offer. It's an open invitation for you for a subscriber or a viewer of this video. So thank you very much for the deep dive of Frankston. Good luck investing.